Hey, uh, welcome back. Uh, we are speaking to Mr. Kapil Kohl, uh, National President of the Indo-American Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Kohl, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be back to back with you again. Yes, we are, we are now doing part two. And uh, in, in this part, I would like to touch on uh, a rather sensitive subject, something which, which has uh, distressed the most of us. I'm going to talk about COVID-19. Um, you know, uh, as we head into the post-pandemic world, help us to understand to what extent did uh, COVID-19 and the restrictive measures put into place because of the virus uh, affected, uh, affected the economy in India, as well as the uh, business community that you serve as part of the uh, IACC. And uh, how exactly did uh, the IACC step in to assist its members uh, on their path to recovery? Right. Um, first, um, there is there is a an example that I had uh, read many time many years or rather decades ago. Right. That what is it to be rich or successful, and who is richer and who is more successful? It's always relative. So, um, whether you have a trillion dollars, billion dollars, million, or thousands of dollars, uh, it's not that which determines whether you're rich. It is compared to the other that determines whether you're rich or poor. Right. So, if in a country uh, everybody has a dollar, then nobody is rich and nobody is poor. But if one guy has two dollars, and everybody else has one dollar, then that guy is the richest guy in in the country. Right. All right. So it's always relative. Now, why I'm taking this example is that in during the pandemic, the first time in the history of this civilization that the whole world shut down. Okay, literally shut down. So whether you say that whether a person was more badly affected or less affected. It's all relative. Everyone was shut into their own little room in their own home. Irrespective of whether you're a billionaire, trillionaire, or a, a poor person, or, a, or or whatever, right? So it was one of, it was an equalizer across the board, okay? It showed everyone their place in this planet at that point of time. Now. Yes, it's impacted many businesses, many people. But there again, what I said in my part one interview is that it is to me the way I, because, okay, I'm a heart patient. I had a fatal heart attack in 2008, 15th August, 2008. I was revived by electric shocks. I subsequently underwent a triple heart surgery. Right. Okay. In 1997, in March, I got run over by a car. Oh. All right. So I have a, a, my femur snapped in two, and I've got a plate in my left thigh for my femur. Okay. So I had two major traumatic events in my life, amongst other, other economic and other issues. Uh, is it good? Is it bad? No. No, it's all relative. And why I say it's relative? Uh, I go on a philosophical plane, and which is that during pandemic, everybody had enough time to sit back and think about what they were doing, what they are, where they want to go, what they want to be, and whether they're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. And believe you me, if you're honest with yourself, then you come to the conclusion that you, we were all living, working, and thinking in the wrong way. Okay, right. We're all in a fantasy. So I, as, as you can, as you can see, I'm very fond of wearing good clothes. I'm very fond of eating good food. I love cars. I love driving. All right. So, but the pandemic taught us all that that is not the right way. Period. You can still be happy. You can still do things 
but reinvent yourself. So it was a time, it was a time to recalibrate our mental processes, our attitudes, our way of life. All right. Yes, it's impacted us. But when everybody is being impacted, you can't say that it has only impacted you and nobody else. Right. Yes, if you are singularly impacted, that's something as the case. How did the chamber help? I honestly, I of course became a president uh, for one year in September 2021. My term just ended a, a, a couple of days ago. All right. But uh, the chamber, uh, the, the incoming, the new president and the other committee members have given me the responsibility of carrying forward these initiatives on the environment and technologies in a manner because they feel that my passion and dedication is there and it's for me to carry this forward. So I am for carrying these initiatives forward. Uh, how did the chamber really help its members? Uh, I'll be honest with you, uh, no, we could not really help at that point of time. But yes, I have taken it upon myself as a chamber that we should bring about uh, a closer rapport between the US and India, and especially in the MSME sector, because when it comes to multinationals, whether it's Microsoft or whether it's General Motors or whatever, they've got enough resources and they've got enough abilities to do things on their own. But the MSME businesses need the help of chambers like ours exactly. to collate the facts. And like you very rightly said, you, you made a very good statement, Francis, in the beginning. That people think that chambers are outdated. No, you, you. In fact, you need the chambers even more. Exactly. Why? Because it's like saying, uh, I, I don't know whether you know or not, but there is something known as synaptic space. Not familiar. Knows. Not familiar. You don't. You're not familiar. okay. So, so when the brain gives uh, an instruction to the body. It gives it on the basis of what? It gives it from the information flow from whether it's your extremities, your fingers, touch, smell, sight, right? So all these impulses come in. They come in through the nerves and they come in through, and the, your brain processes it. And then when it sends the instructions through the nerves, it goes through the synaptic spaces which have electrical energy. Right. And if the synaptic spaces don't have enough, vibe, let's say, energy or whatever, right? The information cannot pass through and your body starts to fail and you fall ill. In the same way, chambers are entities that collate a lot of information from both the sides of society, industry, and the government, right? And through connectivity, you understand how you can position the information with whom and where it can have an impact and help everybody in the process. And there are many things that certain people can confide to certain people as persons, right? And not be misunderstood. And like I told you earlier, circumstances lead you through different paths. Yep. So. There are few people or chambers or whatever that can actually understand these different people, these different forces, and help to bring about and bridge, uh, bridge between these forces and solve issues, solve problems, and take things forward. Right. So in the pandemic, we couldn't do much, no. But definitely post-pandemic, we want to do a lot more, including we are partnering with the Value Reporting Foundation which has just rechristened itself in a different name, but it's a prime entity in changing accounting standards globally to involve environmental cost in your cost of production. Right. So that's that's going to create a lot of value. Now, um, I just want to touch on uh, one particular aspect of, uh, you know, uh, help, helping uh, the, the micro, small, medium enterprises as well. Uh, there's a lot of uh, skilled manpower. There's a lot of talk about skilled manpower coming from India. And, uh, you know, we're talking about 
doctors, we are talking about engineers, we are talking about IT professionals. And, and uh, me being in Singapore, I personally experienced uh, a huge influx of uh, skilled professionals coming in from India uh, in various aspects, even, even in the property industry as well. Now, um, I just need to know uh, how does this, uh, to, to what extent has this benefited India by you know, uh, having uh, Indians mo moving all over the world taking up very important and very influential positions? Um, okay, one, it definitely helps in uh, improving the uh, equity of this country and right. making it, uh, making it uh, uh, have a better weight in the global society as a whole. You're taken more seriously, all right? Uh, pre pre two thousand, the Y two K. I mean, I was I started touring the world in my work since nineteen ninety three. Okay, and I know how I was received in different parts of the world at various points of time, and post Y two K, people looked at me and said. You are an Indian, said, yeah. You guys solved the problem of white, okay? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Right. So before that, uh, they would look at my, I'm, I'm being literal. Huh? I, don't, yeah. I still remember this in, in, in I went to, to South Korea and to Seoul. And he looked at my passport and he said, which other countries have you been to? So I showed him UK, Germany, etc. Ah, okay. And then he stamped my passport, right? And I understood that he was a bit doubtful about what I was doing, who I was, why am I coming there, etc. So, to answer your question, definitely it uh, it it gives us uh, it gives us a respect, it gives us equity. It would therefore therefore give us the uh, leverage to say that products and Indian industry would have more uh, sort of acceptance globally, which is good for our economy. Uh, but at the same time, I think I would hope that our country and our leadership has a greater role in the future balancing out of the various strifes and the troubles that are taking place in this planet. There's a lot that we can we can address and solve and actually focus on the right issues because uh, the environment is the biggest elephant in the room. Right. All these other things, whether it is Ukraine or whether it's Middle East or whether it is uh, uh, Mexico, I don't know. It, it's, it's irrelevant because if we get, if we defray our time, resources on such issues, and not attend to environmental issues, then definitely the pandemic is not the last one. We're going to get impacted. And I, okay, I would say I take my hats off to your to to Indonesia that you're rebuilding your entire capital because you uh, you acknowledge that Jakarta is sinking because of environmental factors, right? So in the same way, in our country, Uttar Pradesh is taking steps. In, they've introduced a climate change desk, et cetera, so that if, as and when glacial melt and these things happen, then the state can actually take care of its people and relocate or do what is necessary to contend with this. And, you know, there's a, a real life example. Uh, we always think that taking an insurance is sometimes uh, irrelevant. Why do we take life insurance, medical insurance? Right. And just before my heart attack, I nearly cancelled my health insurance. Wow. <laughs> I said I never wanted it. My my grandparents lived up to 100, right? We are healthy guys. We I never would I never drank and smoke and things like that. So I said I got a healthy life, etc. and all that. I'm if I'm if I don't need it this year, I'm gonna stop it. That very year I got a heart attack. All right. So when you plan for something. When you plan for glacial melt or uh, or 
the rise in temperature, which will definitely happen. It's happening. All right. When you do that, then you're going to be safer and you will become, you will transit the period. But if you're going to look at wars and the conventional stuff that we are occupied in, then the environment will come with one, one Fukushima and that will be enough to clear the entire problem and put you back on path. So I would say that our way of life in India, our philosophy uh, is etched in time, very deep in time, and it has relevance. We have been a very multicultural setup. We continue to be so. And uh, I think India is positioned to really play a good role if we can we can move forward sensibly. Uh, thanks for that. Um, you know, I actually had a list of questions that I, I wanted to ask you, but uh, let me sidetrack a little bit since we are, we are on the topic of, uh, you know, uh, the products of the Indian education system. Um, if, if you are able to make a change in the Indian education system to make it better, um, maybe it's uh, tweaking certain, certain subjects to make it more relevant to today's world. What, what would they be, actually? What would the changes be? That's a very good question. Um, I would say focus on one, getting the children out into the physical environment. Yep. All right? Going to a forest right? Uh, interfacing or interacting with animals, right? Uh, going and meeting people in who are in difficult circumstances, right? Meeting a child, talking to a child who does not have education and does not have any access to education. And how is that child coping with their lives? Or going and meeting, there are a lot of lot of young people in most uh, Southeast Asian, South American, or poorer society, African societies, where vocationally they learn things and grow, right? And even in, in fact, I was I was for I founded the Alliance for Dual Vet in India on behalf of the German government and Indian government. It right. was an entity where you know that the German educational system uh, enables you to grow vocationally and you get degrees which are equivalent to MBA or PhDs from coming up from a vocational aspect, not from a traditional educational aspect. So I think it's not just about books. It's about what real life also teaches you. Yep. And I think there should be an option from childhood that you can take and should take Along with the um, I'm sorry, I think the sound just cut off. Your your sound just cut off. Vocational plane. Okay. Yeah, now it's back. Okay. Not just it's not just theory and books. All right. If you want to know what the environment is, go, go to the environment. Live in it for a bit of time, maybe a week or whatever. Grasp it. You want to know how the poor who don't have education, how do they grow? How do they learn? Learn from them. All right. So learning, is, and, and I'll tell you, uh, there are uh, three, three people, three women. Uh, one, I'm forgetting her name. Her father was uh, in South Africa. And uh, his mother stayed back in, in the UK, I think. Her mother, rather. And she grew up and educated herself on her own with her father in South Africa. Right. And if you Google her, she's the first aviator who established the postal system between South Africa and London. All right? Then I think even Amelia Earhart, the aviator, yeah. learned Again, not from book, 
So what I'm trying to say is that there's no one way of education. Yes, definitely, by and large, people should go on the conventional route. Right. But there are other ways of educating yourself, which should come in and be a part of the curriculum and say that, okay, fine. Like, for example, now what's happening in our times in Fortunate, you now can combine both humanities and sciences right. and go forward. In our time, you have to either branch out to one or the other. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think mean, we should evolve into a more uh, sort of, uh, let's say, a laissez-faire way of learning how you can learn and progress in life. Right. Even even in uh, Singapore at this point in time, uh, we are making education more relevant. We're keeping it real. And uh, we're coming up with new ways to uh, create a holistic system of uh, yeah. education. So it's all encompassing. Uh, the kids are encouraged to go out there, to mingle, you know, to to get to to make everything uh, purely relevant and real. Yeah. You know, so this is what's happening in Singapore. So yeah, thanks for you know, I think I think one thing while we are while we are at this point, yeah. I must say something which I have practiced all my life. Right. Okay. Uh, education is as good as that you can apply it at the point of time when you have a crisis and you have a problem. At that time, you don't have books. With, and, and now that you're talking this, there's something which I have to hark back to my grandmother. Right. Uh, I'm talking now 1964. So we were walking back uh, from, uh, in Shimla, you only could walk, you can't take a car. Yeah. So while walking back home, she asked me, she said, Kapil, who's your best friend? So my best friend now, even today, he's my best friend. His name is Dhananjay Date. So I said, Nani, my best friend is Dhananjay Date. So she said, no, he's not your best friend. So I got confused. So I said, okay, maybe. I said, okay, I got, and I was a pretty close guy when I was a kid. I didn't have very many friends. So I said, well, the second best friend is uh, is Pradeep Sharma. So she said, no, he's also not your friend. So I said, Nani, I'm getting a little confused out here. You asked me to name my best friends. I've named them. You say they are not. So what do you think? And who do you think is my best friend? So she said, what I'm trying to get at is, would it say, what are, what are we right in saying that when you're in a crisis, then your best friend will always be there for you? Yep. And you're in trouble? I said, yes. She said, well, here's the fact of life. When you're in a crisis and you're in a disaster, then the only best friend who is with you is your knowledge and the books that you studied, nothing else. At that point of time, you have to attend to the crisis with whatever knowledge is there in your head. All right? And what's there for you practically. All right. Now, if you can't attend to the crisis at that time, you've learned nothing. So remember, knowledge is your best friend. So coming back to education, problem solving is something which should be taught also in schools. Right. Put the guy in a mess, put him in a problem and see how you how we solve that problem. At that point of time, all that knowledge, if you have learned it, actually learned it, will come to play. Right. Amazing. Amazing. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. I mean, uh, that you, you've touched a chord with me uh, because I have three young kids as well. So you okay. know, as, as we are moving forward, uh, planning their education and, and and their pathway, which path they are supposed to take in life. On, on our end, we are, we are we are keeping it very open. Uh, we do not pressurize the kids, but of course, we impart to them the importance of knowledge, the uh, importance of being uh, there with an open mind. You know. Which, which is yeah. very important. Now, um, we have 10 more minutes to the end of this part. So um, maybe what I can do is I can, can I ask you, um, I do understand that, you know, business is all about connections. It's all about connections, uh, local as well as international. And the more connections we have, the more opportunities that are open up for us. So I do understand that you also have various activities planned up for your members throughout the year. Um, would you be able to highlight within within the next, I think we have nine minutes left. Um, would you be able to highlight uh, maybe one or two events that you have done and uh, how these events have gone about uh, assisting your members? Right. Um, 
as I've explained to you regarding my uh, E3 philosophy, right. uh, so I have in the course of my last one year, uh, in each event focused on uh, bringing about an awareness on the environment, right? And along with the environment, something that happened uh, towards the last week or so, and suddenly it popped up, is that it's a development where the US Consul General in Calcutta, uh, she brought out the light that there was a lack of representation of women in our chamber and in our activities, and that women's rights and women's issues were very critical in the development of our society. Right. And it's not just our society. Uh, I agree, and not just to that, that when you educate and empower a woman, then as a mother, she has a multiplier effect of um, an, a, a society uh, becoming more educated, more evolved than if you just simply educate a, a, a male child. So we formed uh, the, we instantly formed the uh, women's empowerment group in the chamber. And we have on board uh, an extremely celebrated um, uh, advocate who champions these issues in India. And we're gonna be bringing about a series of these programs to bring up women's issues and women's empowerment issues in society. So that's one development which happened recently. And the other thing which I could remember, uh, which is a practical thing, which is when I had uh, uh, the event in, in, in Calcutta, it was a felicitation night. Right. And we were having this uh, uh, dinner and they followed one philosophy and in a practical way and very sophisticated way, where I said, waste not, no, want not, Waste, waste not. Yeah. So the dinner was served in a way, and this happened on its own. It was curated in a way where the food on the plate was very beautifully put. It looked very nice. Too good to eat. Smelled <laughs> very nice. It was very tasty. And yeah. it just had enough to feed you. So you could not waste it. Right? So I felt nice on that night that in a spontaneous way, uh, something that I was preaching was actually practiced to a great degree on that night. Right. So for me, one thing which I've been trying to focus on during my event, and for example, if you've seen my speeches and all, I wear a, I wear a white suit, right? Seen it. Now that white suit uh, was bought by me on an 80% discount sale in 2010, 26 January, at a bogey store in right. New Delhi, Indira Gandhi Airport, when the store was closing, and it was a shop store. It was a shop soil suit, okay. but I liked that suit had a lot. Instead of paying about eighty-five thousand rupees, I just paid about eight thousand rupees for it. Okay, I cleaned it up, dry cleaned it, looks pristine, and since then I've been wearing it regularly. So what I have been trying to do is I'm trying to actually physically be an embodiment, embodiment of whatever I'm talking about. So it's who I am, what I represent, the values that I, I am expounding, right? That people should appreciate that, okay, this guy is worth listening to. And when he sees that, okay, the guy is not, okay, he's well-dressed. But well dressed doesn't mean that you've got to go out and buy a new suit or a new shirt every time. Yes. No, <laughs> not at all. And there's something else which I've been trying to do uh, during our textile seminar. There was one which I asked them to start. They're working on it now. And which is that in the leather trade, in shoes, uh, traditionally, you also had the corner store, shoe store that used to don mend your shoes and mend right. your leather products. Yeah. Right? So I'm encouraging the textile industry to make clothes out of recycled garments. Second, if 
if a star or a famous personality can wear a shirt with a statement, right? Or wear torn clothes and say, torn jeans and say, that's fashion. Then why can't you wear darn clothes and say, that's fashion? And if you're that rich, then no problem. You got the money, spend it. No doubt you should spend it. Other, how will the how will the economy uh, run? Yeah. Okay. So instead of spending ten thousand dollars on your shirt yourself, how about spending a hundred thousand dollars? Right. Buy that many shirts. You wear your shirt, and you take those shirts and donate them and give them to people and children or whoever who can't afford those shirts. Right. And right. maybe you can put a statement and say, you see me wearing this. This is not one. I bought a thousand of them. 999 I have gifted to poor people. Right? Go and spend. Spend wisely. So a couple of these instances which I have tried to, which I, I think it made them back. The other one is, of course, yes, a major thing that's happened is that our chamber has been able to change the drone policy in India. Okay. Yeah. So drone logistics and drones as an industry are being, are change is changing because of what I have been expounding and what are the advantages of drone logistics. Right. Right. Thanks for that. Now, um, we have come to the end of uh, part two. Uh, there will be a part three um, because okay. we still have we still have a lot of uh, questions for you, uh, Mr. Sure. Paul, it, it's been a pleasure having you. Um, we will meet you again in part three. It's a pleasure. It's a it's really a pleasure and an honor. Thank you. I shall wait for the part three. Thank I'll you. See you in a bit. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you.